God with me for our worship team that's here this morning and have been here for these last nine weeks helping us. Um, we could not do it without each of them, and I am grateful. This morning, we are continuing in our series entitled God Size Things, where we have been looking at how God wants to use our lives to do God-sized things in and through us. And this morning, fittingly, I want to look at the life of a mother who allowed God to do God-sized things through her. So we're going to jump in to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Um, I told the team here earlier that I really wanted to read the entire chapter, but I didn't want y'all to get mad at me. So I'm going to try to summarize and then start reading at verse 10. But essentially, this is the birth story of Samuel. Samuel, for those of you who may not know, um, is, I think, undoubtedly one of the most, probably the most prominent judge of the history of Israel. And Samuel's mother's name is Hannah, and his father's name is Elkanah. Now, as sometimes happened back in the Bible days, Elkanah had two wives because Hannah was unable to conceive. And so when we find Hannah in our story in 1 Samuel this morning, we find her after having been ridiculed and upset and belittled because she was not able to bear children, which as you already know, meant so very much in that culture. And so they would make it their business each year to go to the tabernacle, which was at Shiloh, to worship the Lord. And we'll pick up here in 1 Samuel 1 and 10. And it says, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Hannah was upset because she was being uh, ridiculed by her husband's other wife because she couldn't have children. And it says in her deep anguish, she prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Verse 11 says, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli, uh, he, he observed, Eli was the priest, Eli observed her mouth and Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Verse 15 says, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only make the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. 
after he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli. And she said to him, pardon me, my Lord, as, a, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me that I, what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Thank you for enduring with this passage of scripture. And this morning with your patience and your concentration and your prayers, I want to speak with you from the topic, the theme, the subject, God size things be available. God size things be available. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our collective hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, for you are our strength and redeemer. God size things be available. If you are just joining us for the first time, then you will need to uh, prayerfully go back and catch up on the sermons you've missed in this series because we're building upon where we've been. And so you will remember, if you've been journeying with us, that this sermon series is all about increasing our faith to be able to do God-sized things. God-sized things are things that only God can do. So I want to be clear that this sermon series is not talking about us thinking up wonderful, great ideas of stuff that we want to do for God or stuff that we want to do with God. This sermon series is about us understanding that God already has plans and ideas that God can and will do in and through our lives if we will just make sure that we are available to God to do it. I'm talking about things like miracles, signs, and wonders. Uh, not your run-of-the-mill kind of stuff that you and I maybe can do on our own. God-sized things are things that require God to move and to speak and to say something in our lives. And that's really the premise about this entire thing that we've been talking about is I want to convince you that God is always working, speaking, and moving around us. I want us to be convinced convinced about the fact that because God so loves the world, because God so loves you and I, God has plans for our lives and God doesn't want us to be unclear about that. And so all around us, each and every day, in our relationships, in our circumstances, whatever we're doing, if we aren't doing anything but going from upstairs to downstairs, going to the kitchen, to the bedroom, to the den, God is still in your midst and God is still working always moving, always speaking, always seeking to get your attention so that you can know and I can know that God wants to do something in and through our lives. This I told you several sermons ago, but it's important to bring it up again as I talk about being available today. The first thing God needs to do is get us in position to hear and then to do the God-sized thing. Uh, God has to position our lives so that we can be aware that God is moving and speaking so that then we can know that God wants to move and speak through us. And so it's important that you know that it's not you and I doing it, but it's God at work. And, and that is what the Apostle Paul told us in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, Paul says, So look, my dearest friends, as you have always done, even now in my absence, he essentially says, keep working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Keep doing the things and allowing your life to be used by God. And here's the key, the bold part that there on the screen for it is God who is at work within you giving you the will and the power to achieve God's purpose. 
God is the one who will give you the will and the power to do God-sized things. And so as I told you a couple weeks ago, you don't have to tell God your limitation. God knows all about our limitations. So God really isn't so concerned about what we can't do because God knows and God wants us to know that there is nothing that's too hard for God to do. Yeah, that was a good place for an amen. I hope you said it. I, I like it when y'all give me amens even virtually. But God is the one who is at work in us, giving us the power and giving us the knowledge and the will to do it. And so the point is that God, by Holy Spirit, does the heavy lifting. But we still have a part to play. Uh, we're not puppets. Um, God isn't managing and manipulating our lives with strings coming out of the back uh, of our heads. And so we have a uh, free will. And what this sermon in particular is about is us yielding our free will, yielding our gifts, yielding our talents, yielding our abilities to say, God, if you want to work in and through me, I'm available to you. I want to be used by you. God will do the hard part. God will do the heavy part. But don't be unclear. You and I still have a part to play. We still have something that we need to do. Um, it's like this. I told you, this thing's going crazy. I told them this morning. I told them, I told you that one of the things that you need to do is to remain useful. And last week I preached about how you remain useful by being healthy. And I told you that with your spirit, your mind, your emotions, and your body, you must be healthy having an outlook and a perspective of wanting to cultivate healthiness throughout your life. Today, we're going to talk about you being useful by being available. And then next week, we'll wrap this part up by talking about obedience. But God does the hard part, but there's something for us to do. We have to be useful by being healthy and by being available. This is what I want you to understand uh, what, what I mean by available today. To be available to God simply means giving God attention and access in our lives. I want to be careful because I don't want you to be confused. I know a lot of times when we talk about availability, uh, we limit that to simply time. And so we say, well, I give God a week in worship every Sunday. And now it's even easier than ever because all I got to do is get out of the bed. Wait a minute, some of y'all are in bed right now? Oh my goodness. So, so we want to give God time, uh, but this is a little bit more than just uh, giving God an hour of worship or reading your Bible 30 minutes a day. Uh, because what, is, what you have to understand is that you can come to worship for an hour each week and you can read your Bible for uh, 30 minutes each day. But if you don't give God access to your life, then you won't be able to be used to do God-sized things. So to be available means to give God your attention. So you're alert to God's voice. When God says move to the right, you move to the right. When God says back up or be still, you back up or you're still because God uh, has your attention. Uh, you know how it, how it is when someone has your attention. Uh, you go into a room and you see them and, and you can't hardly even let your thoughts, just me, your thoughts lose. Okay, all right, I'm sorry. I'm saying when someone has your attention, you know how that feels. But does God have your attention each day is what I'm asking. And then once you give God attention, the second step is to make sure God has access to your life, access to your words, access to your thinking, access to your attitude, access to your means and your resources, because God wants to use all of those things to do God-sized things. Some of us don't mind giving God an hour of our time and worship each week, but when it comes to God having our thoughts and our thoughts being uh, changed and transformed into God's thoughts, then we have a problem. Uh, some of us don't mind reading the Bible every now and then, uh, but when it comes to changing our language and making sure that the words coming out of our mouth uh, speaks the truth and the oracles of God, then we know God doesn't have access to our tongues. But this sermon is about challenging us to make sure that we remain available to God. And so essentially, I'm asking this really simple question. Will you allow God to do what God deems best in and through your life? 
When you realize that God is, lead, is moving and is speaking and, and is working all around you, uh, do you go with God or do you challenge God? Um, okay, let me say it this way. Uh, when a leader or someone who has authority over you uh, starts to tell you something for your own good, perhaps to correct you or challenge you, um, do you say, I don't need you to tell me that, I'm not listening to you, I know as much as you do, I got as many degrees as you do, Pastor Daniel, I mean, or do you receive and do you have the ability to let God do what God deems best? This is what the prophet Jeremiah learned in Jeremiah 18. One through six, you can go and read it, but I just picked it up here in verse three. Uh, Jeremiah was invited to go down to the potter's house, uh, and he saw the potter working with some clay on the wheel. A and what happened was the potter was working with the clay, and the pot became damaged. Uh, God had an idea, or the potter had an idea, and while the potter was working, uh, maybe it was a she, uh, the, pot, the, the, the clay got messed up. And so the text says uh, that, that the, the potter then shaped it a different way according to what seemed best to the potter. And guess what the clay did? The clay went with it. The clay didn't stand up and say, you can't form me that way. I, I won't go that way. I don't want to bend into that. I don't want to be a cup. I want to be a plate. I don't want to be a bowl. I, I want to be a pitcher. No, the clay let the potter do whatever the potter deemed necessary. And here's the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah and that comes to us this morning as well. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand. That's the essence of availability. That you realize that you are like clay in God's hand. And so God can form you and can make you, can shape you, can mold you, and then God can reform you, can remake you, can reshape you and remold you. I'm preaching in here. Somebody say amen. If we're going to be available, we have to allow God to have our attention and access to every area of our life. We have to remember that we are like clay in the hand of the potter. Let me give you three ways that I believe from our text this morning, the Lord would have us to be available in order for God-sized things to occur through our life. The first thing I see is that we have to be available even when things are uncomfortable. God size things to be done in our life, we have to continue to let God do what God is doing. I I've told you Hannah's story. She was barren. Uh, her husband has another wife. Uh, she gets ridiculed and um, she gets accused of being a drunkard when she goes to pray uh, because it doesn't look like her prayer and her worship doesn't look like somebody else's prayer and worship. Uh, all throughout this text, we see that Hannah is uncomfortable. Uh, she's ostracized in the community. She doesn't seem to have any friends. Her husband doesn't understand her. In a part that I didn't read, her husband essentially said, look, why do you need a son? Aren't I better than 10 sons? No, sir. So all through her life, she was made to be uncomfortable. But it was out of that uncomfortable life that God used Hannah to do a God-sized thing. She birthed the greatest judge of Israel. You go back and you look at the record. Samuel did things that no one did before or after him. And he was brought up and he was conceived through prayer. So when I say that you have to be available even when things are uncomfortable, what I'm literally suggesting is that God wants us to remain trustworthy, devoted, and prayerful even when we are uncomfortable. Here's where the rubber beats the road. When things get tight for you, when things get uncomfortable, when things don't go your way, when you're upset, uh, either literally or figuratively, when your plan doesn't unfold the way you thought it should, when the timing of the thing is a little bit slow or faster than you wanted it to be, do you still remain trustworthy in the hand of God? Are you still devoted to God, giving God your earnest prayer, saying, God, I don't understand it, but I want you to use me, saying, God, show me the way. It doesn't look like I thought it would look. Even when when things are uncomfortable, can God still trust you to let God do what deems God deems best? 
Because I gotta let you know, my brothers and my sisters, if we're gonna do God-sized things as individuals, and if we're gonna do God-sized things as a church community, as I believe God is calling us to, we are going to have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Because the best things that God has for us aren't gonna always line up with our agenda and our plans. God will have to make us uncomfortable then to be able to get us in position to do some God-sized things. But not only does being available mean that you are willing to stay committed to God even when you're uncomfortable, but secondly in our text, uh, not only do you have to be uncomfortable, but being available means that you are available to do the unusual. You got to be available to do the unusual. I'm still in the text. Uh, in verse 11, while Hannah is still praying and pleading and crying out to God in anguish for what she needs and what she wants, she makes a vow to the Lord. She says, look, God, if you will give me a son, I will dedicate him back to you. I'll make sure him a, a Nazarene, a Nazarite. Uh, he'll never cut his hair. He won't drink, drink, small, drink strong alcohol. I will give him back to you. That's peculiar. It's unusual uh, for Hannah to say this thing I desperately need and want if you give it to me, I'll let you have it back. But that's exactly what Hannah does. When you go down to verse 21, as I read, Hannah tells her, her husband, and we're sure that he had already discussed this and she, he already knew about this, but he's just remind, she's reminding him to say, look, I'm not going with you. Uh, because once the boy is, is weaned, which would have been about two or three, then we're going to leave him there at Shiloh to be dedicated to the Lord. This is what I like about Hannah, and I want you to listen clearly. Hannah made a vow because she wanted to get something that she desperately longed for. And some of us have been there. We've made some vows to the Lord. Lord, it won't happen again. Give me one more chance. Lord, fix it, God. I will be better next time. We've made vows to God when things get tight. But then when the circumstances change, we don't keep our vow. But what I like about Hannah is that Hannah did something unusual, is that she made a vow and she kept it. And if you and I are going to be able to do God-sized things through God's power, we're going to have to be available for God to ask us to do some unusual things. What am I simply saying? God-sized things are often atypical things that feel unnecessary. I'll say it again. Things that are God-sized, they're often atypical. They're not run-of-the-mill stuff. And when you really think about it with your human mind, uh, when you consider it with your human thinking, you say, it don't take all that, God. That ain't necessary. I don't feel like you really need all that money. I don't think you need me to go to school all these years. Come on, God. Why is it taking so long for you to prepare that spouse? How come I can't conceive and I'm getting older? Sometimes it feels like what you're going through is unnecessary. But what you have to understand is that God-sized things require us to be willing to allow God to do some unusual stuff. Uh, I'm simply saying this. Can God set you apart to do the unlikely or the unexpected? I, I know it's getting tight. Y'all might not like it, but this is essentially what I'm asking you. As you're listening to this sermon, if God steps into your life today and asks you to do something that no one expects, would you be willing to do it? Because God is asking. Uh, would you be willing to do the unlikely thing? Um, will you forgive when the person doesn't say, I'm sorry? Is this thing on? Uh, uh, w w will, you, will you turn the other cheek or will you leave an abusive situation uh, when God gives you an out? Uh, it might not be the most comfortable. It might seem a little unusual, but if you're going to be able to allow God-sized things to be done in and through your life, you're going to have to be okay. We're saying this seems unnecessary. This is unexpected. This is unlikely. God, I don't feel comfortable. But nevertheless... Use me, Lord, and do what you want to do. God-sized things are things that will often be unusual. And it'll be unusual to you, 
But this is where it really gets hard. It's going to be unusual to other people. Uh, 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 some people uh, are going to say, what? You ain't doing that? Why did you vow not to have sex until you're married? It's 2020. Give that stuff up. Uh, why are you still doing that stuff? It, it don't take all that. That's unusual. That doesn't make sense. But you have to know the word of the Lord that God spoke to you. And you have to stay committed even when you're uncomfortable. And even when what you're asked to do is unusual. And, and lastly, uh, if we want to do God-sized things and have God uh, do God-sized things through our life, we're going to have to be available and make our commitments unconditional. We have to make unconditional commitments. I'm still in the text here. And what the Bible says is that Hannah took Samuel back to Eli and they had a bull and they sacrificed. And then she said, look, I'm giving him to you. I prayed for this child. God granted him to me. And now I'm giving him back to you. Uh, not for three or four years. Uh, not until he's a teenager. He can come help us work in our family business. Uh, but I'm giving him to you forever. His whole life, you can have it. I'm not putting any conditions, God, on what I'm giving to you because I realize that everything I have came from your hand and so you can do what's best with it. Here's a real question for you. Are you able to give your life, your circumstances, your resources, your time, your talent, your treasure to God without condition? Or every time you do something for God, do you put a condition on it? Well, well God, I'll do this as long as. Oh, well, God, if it goes this way, then I, I got you on the other end. Or are you willing to say, God, I'll give you even the greatest blessing you've ever given me. This air in my lungs, the, the use of my, my mind, the ability, the talent, I'll give it back to you to use as you see fit. No conditions asked of you. If you trust God, don't put conditions and constraints on your yes. Just say, yes, Lord. We learned that uh, in our experience in God a few weeks ago. That the two things, two words that don't go together is no Lord. Because if Jesus is your Lord, you can't say no. The only answer is yes, Lord. And if you and I are going to do God-sized things, if God is going to use our lives in unusual ways, even when we're uncomfortable, we're going to have to make some unconditional commitments. We're going to have to be willing to release some stuff in our hands now, believing that God is able to give us more and to do more in return, but knowing that even if God doesn't, God doesn't owe us anything because anything we have came from God in the first place. But, but we will need to just say, yes, Lord. Uh, say it with me. Practice it this, this morning. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Yes to your timing. Yes, God. I'll obey. I'm available to you. Let me tell you where the rubber really meets the road here. It's with you being convinced that God loves you so much that anything God asks you to give up, is not worth it or not needed for where you're going and for how God wants to use you. And, and I know that this is hard. There's some things I've been praying about for decades and that I still haven't seen come to pass. And some of you are just like me. Nevertheless, we have to remain committed and devoted and prayerful and not start putting conditions on what we'll do for God, but trust God to do what's best. And you know God can do what's best. This is the last thing I want to show you. In Ephesians 3 and 20, there's a promise. And this is what it says. With God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. And if you really believe that today, 
that you are really in the right position to have God do a God-sized thing through you. Whatever God wants to do, it's bigger and better than what you could do on your own. And whatever God asks you to give, whatever God asks you to learn, whatever adjustment God asks you to make, in the end, it will be worth it so that you can get glory to God and God can be seen in and through your living, your moving, and your being. My brothers and sisters, the challenge this week is very simple. Be available. I know you have to be uncomfortable. I know the request from God might seem unusual, but go ahead and make an unconditional commitment to say, yes, Lord, I'll follow you and I'll trust you because I want to be a vessel for God size things. Amen. Amen. And amen. God, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for loving us unconditionally, for pursuing us, even when we drop the ball, even when we make mistakes. Thank you that you don't hold our sins over us, but you let us know that your grace is sufficient for every sin, every weakness, every area of our life where we need help. And all we have to do is be willing to put ourselves and keep ourselves in your hand by calling on the name of Jesus, by trusting you to take our hearts and our spirits. God, thank you for helping us today to get in position to do God-sized things. I pray for all of those listening here in this sanctuary and all over the internet waves. Help us to release the conditions so that you can do what you want to do in and through our lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, and we say it confidently, amen and amen. This is my desire to honor As you're reflecting on this sermon and what you've heard and what Holy Spirit is saying to you, I want to make this invitation for you to put your life in God's hands. The Bible is clear that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It simply takes a confession with our mouth that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for our sins and rose again. Uh, and then uh, as we believe that in our heart and confess it in our, with our mouths, the Bible says we shall be saved. And so we want to lift this prayer of salvation together. Perhaps this is your first time praying it. And if so, will you tell us that in the comments? Because we want to follow up with you. But for all of us, it's important and good for us to reaffirm our faith. For us to say, God, I trust you anew this day. I give you my heart and my life. Will you pray with me? Dear God, I believe that your son Jesus died on a cross for me and rose from the dead. Help me with any part of me that does not believe. I confess that I have made mistakes and I ask for your forgiveness. I invite Jesus into my life to be my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for my salvation. 
In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. God, every moment I'm awake, every step that I take, our confession is, have your way in us. If you don't have a church home, we invite you to join our church. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, we'll get you baptized whenever we're back in the pool. And we invite you to be a part of our family. God is about to do some God-sized things through the church at Clarendon. And you want to be a part of that if that's what God is calling you to. Right before we go, we're going to give our spoken benediction, which is entitled, As We Go, where we reaffirm our faith and our belief and our commitment to follow God. Will you lift this benediction together? As we go, we confess that Jesus is Lord. We affirm our faith in God's word. We are thankful for God's love. We agree to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly because this is what God requires. Amen and amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile on you, your life, your relationships, your circumstances, and give you great peace. This week, be available to God. Give God attention and give God access to every area of your life and see won't God do a God-sized thing in your midst. I love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms, and God bless you to all of those moms and grandmas who are in heaven. We love you and cherish your memory. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. We'll see you soon.